So, Brandon, we're going into our next section, which is HVAC. And would you like to explain the, the challenge of teaching HVAC in, in our after lunch section here? Sure. Uh, <laughs> HVAC is always uh, very interesting. We've got, we've got any mechanical engineers here. We don't go deep enough. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> elementary. And then for everybody else, typically we go, it starts getting too deep. You know, it's, it's, a, it's not the easiest subject to grasp. So we try to sort of cut a middle ground. So we're, we're going to apologize to everybody in advance. Um, <laughs> no uh, one's going to walk away thoroughly unhappy or happy. That's gonna yeah. Um, one of the things that we have <laughs> tried to do, which I think has gone over fairly well, is... Um, Sort of talking about we got something <coughs> called HVAC 101. It's talking about a lot of the terms, uh, the concepts. Uh, I think it helps illuminate uh, what what we're trying to achieve with the code. Um, and I, I think that's it's been helpful. I think a lot of our class has been helpful for me personally. I'm not a mechanical engineer by trade. A lot of this is Greek to me. Um, so uh, with that, we'll we'll dive in. Yeah. And um, who besides Joe? I know we had a couple. Who else was a mechanical uh, contractor, or code officials, or contract? Engineers, so uh, apologies, guys, because we're going to go sort of deep. But but the main thing is, I want to ask the three of y'all to add to weigh in with comments on this, because a lot of this it gives us a chance. We've got a lot of designers and contractors here. Um, it gives us a chance to sort of say, here's what we think is good, here's what we think is maybe not so good, and and sort of send you on a direction. And then we'll briefly hit the the mechanical um, code requirements. And the other big thing is, we promise that. If you want the full on beam version of this, we're, we'll give you a link to a, a webcast where they just, it's the complete boring entire mechanical section. So have a great time on that one. And I've watched it like five times, so it's terribly exciting. So, <clears throat> but, um, so to begin with, the term HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, the primary purpose from the code standpoint here is to provide comfort for people. And I can see that you are not comfortable because you are freezing. And so, can you bump the temperature a degree over there? We'll see. No, it's, it's, uh, you've, you've, you've just hit upon the classic, uh, the classic issue of the, the challenges of our industry, which is how do we make you uh, less happy? No, wait, that's not right. How do we make us comfortable and, and try not to freeze you out? Because I have the theory, I have this theory that, um, you know, in commercial buildings, the temperature usually errs on the cold side, right? So it's basically, my theory is somehow the guys, we've gotten control of the thermostat and, and in commercial buildings. And um, someone speculated that it's because, it's because the women have the, they own the home. That's what, that's, that the women own the home thermostat, so the guy get the commercial. Building. I don't know if that's true or not, but therein lies the challenge of can we keep, can we keep most of the population in this room comfortable? And you know, some of us are just fine right now. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I love watching people's body language and just sort of how they're sitting and are they like, <laughs> and and are they? You know, you're looking pretty normal over there. Your 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 body language looks. Are you pretty comfortable right now? Yeah. Okay. So, um, interestingly enough, there's an ASHRAE standard that actually deals with comfort. It's uh, it's ASHRAE 55, thermal comfort. And it, it's got a little section of the psychrometric chart. That's that fancy chart that we flip through very quickly that, that basically says, if you keep the temperature in this pretty narrow band, and you keep the moisture level in this pretty narrow band, we'll be able to make, are you ready, 80% of the people in this room comfortable. OK, so right now, let's do a little survey. Raise your hand if you're uncomfortable right now. Go ahead, go ahead, it's all right. Are you, are you, so wait, wait, raise, keep I got to count. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, dang, eight. And how many people do we have in here? 35? 40, something, 36, 38. Yeah, so we didn't quite make it, right? So, <laughs> oh, dang, we failed. So if, if you would leave the room, whoever's uncomfortable, we'll, we'll be able to <laughs> skew the numbers in our statistical favor. Uh, no, but it's, a, it's just a great example. If it's a, and I always thought that was really funny, that ASHRAE's goal to you as designers is to only make four out of five people happy. It's kind of like, yeah, the rest of you don't count. You know, sc you know, well, as long as most of you, screw you, you're done. You're out of here. Sorry, you, you lose. So it's, it's kind of funny that we don't aim higher than that, but literally eight out of ten people. 
That's what we're trying to make comfortable. Um, so uh, obviously it's a challenge because in general the men tend to want it uh, uh, colder and the women are freezing even in the summertime, which sucks. It's not fair. It's not right. So uh, the basic refrigeration cycle is this thing that shows up in pretty much every water cool, uh, every water cooler, every refrigerator, every air conditioner, every heat pump has got this. And it's, it's essentially uh, a device that moves heat around. So heat is taken in and essentially put into a refrigerant and then that refrigerant is circulated around and then heat is rejected out. So heat is moved via this process, right? So once again, the engineers are like, God, and everybody else is like, is this going anywhere? So see, already the challenge is in place. But um, essentially, if you go back to this, the, the, the thing that puts, that, that puts this all into motion is a device that moves a refrigerant vapor around, which is a compressor. And of course, the refrigerant itself is a fluid that in parts of this loop is a liquid, in parts of this loop it's a vapor. And in this, in this world, when we move a liquid, the device is called a pump. When we move a vapor, the device is called a compressor, right? Everyone already made, some people are nodding, some people are going, where is he going with this? So that's, that's essentially this device, this magic device, that heat always goes downhill from hot to cold. The only way to make it go from cold to hot is to pump it, and that's what this device does. Okay? All right, let's see where that takes us. Brandon, load calculations. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Load calculations are really, <laughs> really good. Um, so the idea here is I've got a building. You know, it's, uh, it's made up of all these pieces and parts. I've got all these occupants. Let's size the heating and cooling equipment and the ducts to, to, to heat and cool it properly. Um, it's, uh, uh, take all <laughs> these, you know, there's a whole list of things you need to take into consideration. Um, what's interesting about this is under the residential code, you're, you're required to do this and you're required to size your equipment based upon that. In the commercial code, uh, they give you, I, I think this goes to the complexity of commercial buildings, they say you need to do this, but you don't have to size your equipment, your docks based upon this. So it, it gives you guys some latitude. Uh, which is, is, isn't that always interesting? Been so you interesting have to, to do this calculation in a commercial building but you do not actually have to have your equipment match it or meet it. Isn't that interesting? So they're trying to give you, the designer, some flexibility if you know there, something might be happening down the road or whatever. I just think that's kind of fascinating. Do you all do load calculations? Yes. Um, do you size to it or, or, or how do you handle that? Yeah, do you generally size to your load? Yes. And for one thing, it would not be doing your client a good service if you calculated 10 tons and you put in a 20 ton system because it's oversized, it's not going to operate well, but you're also costing more on the front end, right? So everybody see the value in load calculations? And, and again, it's very different. In the, in the residential world, you must size to it. In the commercial world, you, don't, you, you have that design flexibility. Kind of a different animal. Um, Okay, basic equipment, you may have heard some of these terms before, things that move air, fans and blowers. Um, yeah, I think this is all just guts in it. Compressor moves the air, condensing unit, we'll talk about that in a second. So here is a residential uh, heat pump, and a heat pump and an air conditioner are exactly identical in the summertime. What, what we call a heat pump, what makes it special, or what's a heat pump do that a regular air conditioner doesn't do? Right? It can run backwards, right? So, you know, an air conditioner is a heat pump. It's just a one-way heat pump, right? It always takes heat from your house and rejects it up the hill in the summertime outside, right? Well, what we call a heat pump can essentially also heat our space by taking energy from the outside air and pumping it up the hill and using it to heat our house, right? So that's a heat pump. This is called a split system heat pump. Why is it called a split system? Yep, so we've got this outdoor section here called a condensing unit that has the compressor and the heat rejection. And we've got an indoor coil and a blower that blows across this. And what is connecting the inside and the outside? The, the refrigerant lines, right? Does that make sense? 
So the refrigerant lines are connecting the inside and the outside. So, <laughs> um, you know, this is what a lot of people have in their home, and you'll see this a fair amount in commercial buildings as well, okay, a, a split system, and then the ductwork connects to it. Um, can anybody explain what is a package system compared to a split system? What does package imply? All in one box. Do you see a lot of package systems in commercial buildings? Certain type of commercial building, you're going to see them. And where are they located? A lot of times they're sitting up on top of the roof, right? So a package rooftop unit is a pretty common mechanical equipment. What are the advantages, what are some pros and cons of package system? What's, what's kind of good about a package system? It's, it's cheap. <laughs> It's pretty easy to just plunk it on the roof. And what do you connect to it? Ductwork. Mainly the ductwork, obviously the, the, the electric and whatever else. Um, so it's everything in one box, and we're connecting up to it. What are they maybe not so good about? What do package units maybe not do so well? They're not typically super efficient. Um, do they make variable speed packaged equipment? I think we're starting to see more of that, which is nice. Huh? The larger stuff. It, it's not, uh, generally, package systems don't do the best job of moisture removal. That's one thing that we find, is that they're not typically doing latent cooling, which is moisture removal, all that well. They, they're fine for sensible cooling, which is changing the temperature of the air, but they're not so good about wringing the moisture out of the air. So that's, that's a, a downside of them. So, um, you know, appreciate the pros and the cons. Uh, we talked about heat pumps already, but you know you should appreciate that heat pumps, uh, in the in terms of um, where they extract heat or reject heat, uh, there are really three main places where they can do it from. Uh, one is obviously the air. Okay, so they can ex that's called an air source heat pump. They can extract or reject heat from the air. What uh, uh, the problem with that? What's what's the downside of, of basically extracting or rejecting heat from the air? What does the air temperature do throughout the year? <laughs> it swings pretty wildly, right? So uh, you may also have heard of a ground source heat pump, right? So what is that? What, is, what, are, what are we doing in that case? A lot of times we're putting, um, basically we're putting heat into usually water. That water runs through a tube, and that tube goes into the ground. So we're dumping heat into the ground in the summer, and in the winter we're extracting heat from the ground. Ground temperature tends to be what? You know, a lot more constant, right? Now, it changes a little bit, but anybody ever been in a cave, right? What's the temperature of a cave? Pretty much year-round. It's probably 55, 70 degrees, 60 degrees or something like that. So, um, so there is some definite thermodynamic advantage to the fact that we're always rejecting or always extracting heat from the ground, which is much more of a you know, sort of moderate temperature than the extreme air temperatures we can see. Are, are you guys doing much ground say, source around here? I was doing ground source heat pumps. You see it a little bit. It's definitely got a high premium first cost. I mean, it's, it's a very efficient system, but it's pretty high first cost. We, we don't do a whole lot in Atlanta because you go about 20 feet down and you realize we're sitting on Stone Mountain. So it's a lot of granite. <laughs> it's very expensive drilling when you hit Stone Mountain, in case you didn't know that. So it's a challenge. Um, and uh, but they can work very well. Um, and we also have a, uh, uh, you know, sometimes you'll see where they're re dumping heat or, ex or extracting heat from a lake. So, you know, um, the lake is, again, typically pretty good heat transfer. Um, there's also a device or, or something that we see a lot in schools called a water loop heat pump system. And the premise is, We've got this big loop of water that's circulating throughout the whole building. And over here, we've got a, something to make that water cold and something to make that water hot, usually a gas boiler. We're going to try to keep the temperature of that loop at a pretty reasonably constant temperature. And each zone has a special water to uh, air heat pump. And so what happens is you've got you know, one classroom over here that wants cooling. And they're taking heat out of their space, and they're putting it into the water loop. And you've got another zone over here that needs heating, and they can t take heat out of the water and put the heat into the space. And um, if y'all, anybody here, have y'all done any projects where they've had this? Have you seen these kind of systems? 
a four pipe system. It could be, I was going to say it could be a four pipe loop. That's true. Um, but the idea being here that we can sort of borrow BTUs from one area, British thermal unit, right? Small unit of energy. Uh, we can borrow some energy from one part of the building and sort of shift it around in the other part of the building. Um, that can work. Uh, there's some other technologies today that we think might even be better than that, but that's something you see a lot in schools uh, or in, in bigger schools in, in certain buildings. Um, anything else? Any, uh, my experts here, what do you want to comment on in heat pumps? Anything about this? I think that was a really, that's an example of a really big lake coupled heat pump right here, uh, heat pump system. That's the pump house, and I think that what's not shown is the big hospital that they're building over here in the, in the side. So, comments or thoughts? Okay. So hydronic, when you hear the word hydronic, you think of water, right? So hydronic systems offer tremendous energy saving or, or energy efficiency opportunities because of basically the simple premise. I can move a pound of water a lot cheaper than a pound of air. And I can, in other words, I can move a lot of BTUs with a gallon of water a lot easier and cheaper than I can move BTUs with a gallon of air. Okay, so when you think about it like that, um, there, that you're like, why don't we do this all the time? Well, what's the downside of a hydronic system? More expensive installation. Is it? Yeah, we, uh, suddenly we have to deal with piping and we have to deal with uh, pumps and we have to deal with valves and all the things that make it work. Um, so it's definitely, what, what size would you sort of say you're getting up into when you start to really see hydronic become economical, what sort of what, how many tons? Maybe a hundred tons, somewhere in that range. Um, I'm looking around for y'all. Most of the time, it's uh, a couple hundred tons. Yeah, I mean, it could be. It, it, I'm not trying to put answers out there. It, it's, you know, there are some times when I think we should have done it and we didn't. Like, we we were involved in some uh, high school in Macon that I think they put. Do you remember how many package roof, like 114 it was, package roofs on the building? And you're just like, really? 114 package units? So anyway, but in general, a hydronic system is going to, you know, really perform very efficiently. But we've got to eat that first cost. So that usually means the 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 tonnage has to be up there, you know, big enough, a couple hundred tons, let's say. Um, but it has great advantages. Okay, you probably have heard some of these terms before too. A chiller is a device that makes what? Cold water, okay, chilled water. And then we pump the chilled water to a zone and that provides the cooling effect we want, right? Usually chillers are, are electric motor driven compressors, but sometimes there you can have a gas fired absorption chiller. Um, so there are different types of things that make chilled water, but um, you know, they're making the chilled water, that's the main thing. A boiler is doing what? Making hot water, right? And you know, you might have other systems like steam, but that's pretty uncommon unless there's some specific need for it. And then what is the purpose of a cooling tower? It's when we wanna we wanna reject a lot of heat, right? Okay, so a cooling tower is remember I said a heat pump is moving energy, I mean a refrigeration cycle is moving energy around. Well, we have to be able to dump heat somehow. And in order for that compressor to do its job, it has to you know, basically take heat out of the water, and that heat has to go somewhere. And that heat goes into, a, you, a lot of times, into a water loop that goes out to a cooling tower. And the principle behind the cooling tower is when, when everybody remember from chemistry class, when something changes phase, meaning from a liquid to a vapor, there's a lot of energy transfer there, right? And when you, when you heat a pound of water from, let's say, 100 degrees to 200 degrees, that only took 100 BTUs. That's the de a definition of BTU is it takes a, you take a pound of water, you raise the temperature one degree Fahrenheit. So that's about, a, that's about one of those water bottles right there. A pint is a pound of water. Pint's a pound, the world's around. That's another good drinking song. Um, so, so, you know, okay, to change the temperature of water, you know, from 200 degrees to 212 degrees, that took 12 BTUs. But when you get to 212, what happens to the water? It starts to boil, right? 
And to boil a pound of water, liquid water, into a pound of steam, water vapor, how, anybody know how, about how many BTUs does that take? Anybody want to guess? I'm not going to put you on the spot, but if you said 1,000, you'd be right. It takes 1,000 BTUs to change a pound of liquid water into a pound of water vapor. That's a whole lot of, a whole lot of energy going on. And so in essence, it's that change of phase that what a cooling tower does is water evaporating essentially off of this cooling tower causes a tremendous amount of heat rejection. Okay? Unfortunately, what does this tower have to have continuously supplied to it is makeup. It's got to add more water. Thank you. In, a, a, um, in other words, um, cooling tower makeup water turns out to be a really big deal in terms of water consumption. And in case you didn't know it, in spite of the rain this morning, water's a very big deal in our state. I don't know if it's as big a deal to y'all in Augusta. It's a really big deal to us in Atlanta. You know, for the longest time in Atlanta, it was so great. We could just kind of, you know, Alabama and Florida were like, hey, hey, you're taking all our water. And we were like, sucks to be downstream. Uh, you know. and, uh, but then, uh, then a judge came along and said, nope, nope, that's their water. And all of a sudden we're like, the, the governor of Georgia is like, hey, governor of Florida, you're looking good. Come on and visit. Come on. Hey, Alabama, come over. Let's talk. We want to talk about water. So all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're on the uh, begging side of things of, of, of water. And we're, we're also looking at annexing Chattanooga. It's going to become called Chattalana, so we can <laughs> take their water. So, so there's, yeah, well, well, watch out. I'm just warning you. So, you know, Georgia is an interesting state. Uh, but, you know, anybody know this? The elevation of Atlanta is, is pushing 1,000 feet above sea level. You know, we're like the highest... Uh, big city in, in this whole United States, except for Denver. Denver gets a whole lot of snow melt. We don't have a lot of snow melt, by the way, in Atlanta, in case you were wondering. So, you know, so we're very high up in our watershed, right? And we get a lot of rain. I mean, except when we don't, we get a lot of rain. That's the thing about Georgia, right? We get a whole lot of water every year, except when we don't. We get 55 inches of rain in Atlanta every year, except when we don't. So I'm just saying that, you know, think about that. And, 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 but the, we're way high up in our watershed, and that water hits, and it doesn't last long. And, and it, I mean, it, it drains away quickly. So this is a big deal to us. Water is going to be a really big deal. And I'm saying this, there is a tie to energy here. Um, and, and one of those uh, is that, like, Bill is working on some legislation right now, or legislation or wording of some stuff, to try to encourage people to use low water draw cooling towers. There's different ways you can design a cooling tower to make it use less water. Um, Brandon, do you have some of the statistics on water savings in commercial buildings? Um, maybe not. Maybe it's Burke that I was talking about this with a bit. Um, if you save, there will be a percentage. How's that? That's an excellent statement. That was really helpful. <laughs> um, that, but I, I would like to comment, I think, on the, the energy water relationship. Um, and this is not necessarily code related, but I think it's very important to think about. Um, you know, here, here in Georgia, probably about 80, 85 percent of our, our power is, is coal. And um, when you're generating coal power, um, you're using it for like every kilowatt hour, uh, it's about, you burn off about three to five gallons of water that does not go back into the river. So that's gone. Um, so if you save energy, you save water. Do you ever um, notice how an electric power plant, be it coal or nuclear or whatever, is located right next to a big river or lake? Is that for the view? Is that, is that what it looks like? Yeah. What are they using the water for? Heat rejection again, once again. And you know, they have those big, you know, those big towers that go like this. And uh, what's funny is for the longest time, I think everybody thought that those were nuclear reactors. That's what I always thought. Was, you know, those are just cooling towers. But water goes in and it is evaporated out. That's the heat rejection side of things. Um, and then the- and it is literally like, uh, it, it literally is one kilowatt hour of electricity, which just for reference, you probably pay about 10 cents a kilowatt hour. That represents three gallons of water taken out and not put back. It doesn't leave planet Earth, but it does not travel downstream. Oh. Bill. Yeah, I just like to tell everybody, I'm also working on the Senate bill, 
One of the statistics, I know we looked at this on one of the bigger buildings that we, projects that we worked on was that basically you know, we saved all kinds of water by going to more efficient fixtures, but it was a, it was a fraction of the water that the cooling tower was using. So it's interesting. We're going to probably run out of water before we run out of energy, at least in Georgia. That's an interesting. So then the other, I've talked about energy and water, but the other side is water. You know, how, how, how does water, saving water, save energy? Um, typically, for a municipality, water treatment is their largest single expense. It's very, very energy intensive. The, the national average figure that I've heard is it's usually about 30% of their budget. Um, actually, we had somebody talking too, and they were talking about how much of the, the national power grid was dedicated just to water treatment. And the figure he gave was 10%. I know, isn't that amazing? Which 10 is of all absolutely the phenomenal. That we're in, in this country is all, 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 all energy usage yeah. is for simple treatment of water. So if we actually conserve water in the building, we're not having to treat as much downstream that actually saves a lot of energy. It's really a, a very interesting little, you know, kind of the world is starting to connect itself. Energy and water have an interesting tie that a lot of us don't appreciate. So um, I just think there's some interesting aspects. Sure, sure. Uh, um, so everybody pretty much okay with these? We've spent enough time on this. Well, our, our energy usage in Georgia, electricity production, over 80% comes from coal. Well, coal burning power plants and nuclear power plants have to reject heat, okay? And to reject heat, they're always located next to a river or a lake or something like that. And so the, the statistic is just to make a single kilowatt hour of electricity required uh, about three gallons of water. It's not returning to the water. Exactly. It's evaporating. Yeah, it's evaporating into right. the atmosphere. So. so it's an interesting statistic. Um, okay, any other comments on this? Just some interesting stuff going on that, that it's all kind of connected. The code is very big on controls um, and, and thermostats to, you know, warm us up. Did you catch that? The thermostat keeps, I, I did that on cue. Um, and you're going to learn that the code really at the end of the day uh, is pushing us to use things like a, a seven-day programmable thermostat. There's also some requirements in this code for something called optimum start. Optimum start is um, try to imagine a commercial building that we have it over the weekend set back, okay? So the temperature sets back. Um, if it's, uh, let's say it's in the winter time, uh, you know, in the, in the, come Monday morning, you know, people are gonna be there at eight o'clock, then the thermostat or the controls have to be smart enough to go, look, all Monday morning we let this, or all weekend we let this building drift. It got cold, it might've got down to 58 degrees. We need to know that if someone's coming in at 8 o'clock, we should bring on the heating equipment, in this case, uh, early enough to where we can catch the temperature back up by the time they get there. That's called optimum smart start. And it knows that Monday morning behaves differently than, say, Wednesday morning. Okay? So that's called optimum start. Not a big deal, but as you get to bigger systems, this becomes a code requirement. Uh, DDC controls. Basically, it's just like we're in the digital age. Direct digital controls. This is the wave of the future. This is what we want to use. We can use computers to help us do a lot of things. We are huge advocates, both residential and commercial, of equipment that can adjust itself based on the load at that point in time. 
Variable speed equipment is the salvation for a lot of these problems. Not all our problems, but it can help us save a lot of energy. Variable speed equipment. So in the commercial world, we have a lot of things called VFD. What does VFD stand for? Variable frequency drive. It, it's just the, the technology that allows the system to slow itself down because you know, generally we size air conditioning and, uh, and heating equipment. We size <coughs> air conditioning equipment, if you will, I'm going to do a little hand waving, but the hottest day of the year. We size it for the quote, hottest day of the year. And we size cooling equipment or heating uh, equipment for the coldest day of the year. All right, now don't overthink this. How many days is it not the hottest day of the year? <laughs> okay. I'm hand waving a little bit. We really do it based on number of hours, but very few hours, you know, we use like a 99 or 99.6 percentile number. In other words, the temperature in this city will never get above this, this value. And the value for Atlanta is 92 degrees. And as much as you remember back to the drought we had a couple of years ago when we hit that, you know, ridiculously high, you know, we were getting 100 degrees every day for a couple of weeks in a row. It's like, yeah, but the hours that the, that the temperature outside actually got, uh, you know, to 100 degrees was very, very small, less than 1% of all the summertime. So we size equipment based on the almost hottest day of the year and the, and the almost coldest day of the year. And that means inherently it's oversized, even if we right size it for that condition, it's oversized most of the cooling season. Does that make sense? So what we want is equipment that is smart enough to know that it doesn't have to run on full speed all the time. And so variable speed it gives us capability. In the residential world, we use a different, it seems like we're using a different technology. It's called ECM motors. Do you ever see those in commercial buildings? It, it's so funny. The, the, the commercial world is variable frequency drives, and the, and the residential world is ECM motors. But it's the same concept. It's just or the same uh, outcome, I guess I should say. Um, so I think that's a big thing. And then uh, that's probably enough on this slide. Okay. Who wants to explain an economizer? Who's heard of that term economizer before? And I'm not talking about Clark Howard. He's an economizer. <laughs> so I'll use this analogy. Economizers are kind of like an old southern home that has a whole house fan. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? The whole house fan is located in the hallway. And it's, it's got those louvers, right? And the premise is, before you ever turn that fan on, what do you need to do first? You need to open all the windows and doors, and hopefully you have screens, right? That's the other important thing. So the idea, though, is that when the weather conditions are right, what are you going to do? You're going you're to open up all the windows and, and, and doors and basically flush the building out with lots and lots of outside air, and the cost to do that is pretty low. It's, sometimes economizers is called free cooling. It's not really free because you have to run a fan, but it, you're not running a compressor. And so economizers, here's, here's an example of sort of a typical building where they have some, um, some dampers for outside air, and they're, they're cracked open minimally, minimally to provide ventilation, but most of this is return air, and the return air and the outside air is mixed and chilled down and supplied to the building. And that's great. Well, when the outside air is 55 degrees, maybe what we can do is open those dampers and close that damper, and we can flush the building out with lots and lots of outside air. You see that that could save us energy? All right, so economizers are a good thing. And there's a water side economizer, but we're going to focus on air side economizer. Um, there's also a downside to an economizer. And, and it's like this. How many, how many days of the year are the conditions outside ripe for an economizer? So you've got these, what are some of the factors that might say today's not a good day to have an economizer? Well, first of all, the temperature has to be, you know, in the right temperature range. So let's say around 55 degrees or something. What are, what are the other issues? <laughs> yeah. Today it's nice and cool outside, but if we're trying to air condition our building, today would not be a good day for economizer mode, right? And so the energy code recognizes this. And it's kind of interesting because climate zone three, which is where we're located, has kind of always sat on the fence about economizers. Sometimes the code has said we need them. Sometimes the code has said we don't need them. And um, you're going to run into that 
in a little bit. But um, basically, let me give you a quiz. All right, I'm going to give you two cities. I'm going to tell you, I want you to tell me which one would be not a good choice to run an economizer. Okay, you ready? Asheville, North Carolina, or New Orleans, Louisiana? <laughs> I guarantee you do not want to run your economizer in New Orleans. Because the temperature might be great, but it's the temperature and the moisture, right? So one thing would be if you have an economizer in our climate, you want to have what's called enthalpy controls, which looks at temperature and moisture. Does that make sense? And one of the things you're going to learn is that um, the codes are different on this. There, if you go chapter 5, this code is going to have you install economizers in some, in some applications. And if you go ASHRAE 90.1, you're going to find out differently. And I'll, I'll, I'll be a spoiler here. ASHRAE 90.1 does not require economizers anywhere in the state of Georgia. Okay, so if we like to say if you love vestibules and economizers, this is your code. And if you only want to use them when you want them, then this is your code or something like that. So, all right. Um, I'm not going to even talk about VAV. <laughs> I'm just going to try to speed along here. Air distribution. Uh, I guess we could do this one. Um, here's what happens a lot of times in your basic mechanical systems. Return air comes from the building. Outside air is mixed in. And it goes across a filter, and the fan pushes it across a cold coil. The coil is cold because there's refrigerants in a loop on one side and then the fins on the other side. The, the surfaces are cold. What happens when warm, moist air hits a cold surface? Condensation. And so the condensation starts to collect on the fins. After a while, you start to get a liquid level building up in the condensation, condensate pan. And then just the liquid level just builds up to the point where it's about to drain off. And the thermostat says, nope, shut off, I'm done. And oops. What happened? I cooled the air, but I didn't actually remove any moisture. Because if the system shuts off right at this point before condensate leaves, what happens to all this moisture that's in the pan and in the coil? What will happen to it? It'll just re-evaporate back into the air. And if you want to make it re-evaporate even faster, do something really stupid, which is leave the fan on all the time. You ever seen that in a commercial building? Someone leaves the fan running all the time. There's a big energy penalty to leave that fan on. There's a big moisture removal penalty. Because in other words, the system will cool the air, but it will not dry the air. And that, that is pushing us. By the way, those buildings a lot of times are growing stuff. Yeah? OK, so interesting. I always thought it was kind of funny. Now, I don't know about your bathtub, but at my house, my bathtub, the drain is on the bottom of the, of the tub. And for some reason, mechanical equipment, the drain for the condensate pan is on the side. I was always like, why is that? Why is that? No one's laughing, but I will laugh in my mind, so I'll think about that. So the other thing is that, so what happens in order to dry air out, we actually have to overcool it. We have to supercool it down in order to really get enough condensate collected and, and drain it out. And then it's too cold to dump back in the building. So what do we have to do? The dreaded reheat. OK, so we sometimes use reheat with like a hot water coil that comes from a gas boiler or a gas water heater. The worst reheat we can do is electric resistance. Does everybody understand that electric resistance is not the way we want to make heat? Partly because of the, um, if, you look, if you step back and you look at the whole system of how do we get electricity into a building, this is an intro. I don't know if we talked about this yesterday in residential or not, but if you go to a coal burning power plant, which is where most of the energy in Georgia comes from, we actually have to burn 10 units of coal at the power plant in order to make, are you ready? Three units of electricity show up at the building. Wait a minute. That doesn't sound very good, does it? We've got to burn 10 units of hydrocarbon fuel at a power plant. And we, 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 have, we have to, first of all, we have to get it out of the ground, then we have to ship it down to the power plant. Then when it's at the power plant, we've got to crush it up. And then we fire it and burn it. We take the heat of combustion. We boil water. We make steam. The steam runs through a turbine. The turbine turns. The turbine's connected to a generator. The generator generates electricity. And we ship it down the wire you know, to your building. I put in 10 over here. 
Guess how many you get? Three. That just doesn't sound very efficient, is it? So you say, okay, well, I think I'll use three units of electricity and I'll turn them all into electric resistance toaster oven heat. How efficient is that? If you were trying to make heat over here, you would have been much more efficient if you burned the hydrocarbon fuel at your building. Does that make sense? So I want you to all start designing buildings that burn coal. That's what I want you to <laughs> Lang, can you think of a fuel that might be more efficient than coal instead of burn at the Yeah, so for example, if we burn natural gas at our building with a standard furnace or whatever, we can get 80% of the fuel content as heat into the building. We can go higher technologies. We can get 95% of the energy of the fuel delivered as heat into the building. So if you're trying to heat something, uh, in general, stay away from electric resistance. Does that make sense? Does everybody get that? That's a big rule. You know, uh, I, I'm not, I, again, I'm fuel neutral. I think there are cases where an all-electric building does make a lot of sense. But by far, the Achilles, the Achilles heel of an electric building is how you make hot water or how you're making, you know, if you're not using a heat pump, then you're, you're going to pay a high penalty. Electric resistance heat is very inefficient from what we call the source energy perspective. It took 10 units of coal to make three units of heat. That's not very efficient. Does that make sense? Okay. So, other cool things that we like. The code is pushing us more and more to use energy recovery. There are some cases now where you have to use energy recovery. Energy recovery, and the technology that we like is an enthalpy wheel, a, a desiccant wheel. You want to describe that? I was looking for my paper plate. Sure, sure. Uh, so a, maybe we'll draw this up on the desk. board. Um, they come in a, a wide variety of sizes. Uh, ours at our office is about a uh, about three feet, but you'll have you'll have air coming in from the outside and air leaving the building. And it's, it's going to pass across this medium. And so it's got this desiccant. And the air coming um, from the outside, essentially it dries it up. And actually, while it dries it up, it cools it down. Um, the air from the outside, a lot of times in the summer, has a lot of moisture, right? So it sticks into the desiccant. Yeah. Is that what you were saying? I'm sorry, exactly. maybe I misunderstood. It's drying it out. It's drying out the air. Drying out the air. You get some cooling effect, don't you? Is that a fair statement, Mike? Get some cooling effect from that, though, right? Heat of adsorption. Anyways, you're drying the air out. And then this, this wheel is turning at the same time. So uh, then your, your conditioned air that's dry air is, is, is heading back out. It takes that moisture and sort of recharges this wheel. So it's a, for, for a very small amount of power, you're, you're able to dehumidify. You're able to sort of precondition your air before it actually gets to your unit. So have you all used this technology at all in any buildings? This is, we need to see more of this. This is what we need. We, we need to be using this technology a lot more. The code's going to require it in certain types of applications. We should use it more often. But the idea being that, you know, our ventilation load can be very significant in terms of our energy load. And, the, and, and our big primary energy, uh, enemy, if you will, is moisture. And this is a device that can dry the air out with very little energy. So a desiccant, you've all seen a desiccant before. If you bought a digital camera or leather shoes or something, you know it has that little packet in it? Silica gel, what does it say on the packet? First of all, it's delicious, try it. You're gonna love it. So I want you to go home and try it out. And what they'll do is they'll take that desiccant and, and, and impregnate it on a, a wheel, and they'll put layers and layers and layers of it. The air can still flow through, but the way a desiccant work is, works is if you looked at it under a microscope, it's got holes that are basically the exact same size as a water molecule, and, or about the same size as a water molecule. So um, it's like an activated charcoal or something, if you will. The, the, the moisture in the air sticks to the desiccant, but the air can pass through. And then that wheel turns, and then the air coming out of the building picks up that moisture and takes it on out again. So remember, we, I think we covered this earlier. If 1,000 cubic feet of air go into a building, what has to happen? 1,000 goes out. And if you build a tight shell, you can control a lot better where the air goes out. And, and in the air that we usually pull air out of things like bathrooms and janitor closets, that air, like Brandon said, might be kind of stale air, but 
it's dry. And so that dry, stale air can pick up that moisture and regenerate the desiccant. So this is a great technology. I, I would like to see this. A lot more buildings use this. This is a really good thing for the southeast. Yeah, you can replace the desiccant. Have you all run into this before? I'm looking at you. Um, one of the things we learned from uh, Emory had a, a lab building that they designed, and it wasn't like a, like a, like a, the CDC is located near Emory, and their air, you pretty much let them do all exhaust. You know, you don't want to mess with a CDC air. I, I don't want to live downstream of the CDC. <laughs> I, you know, <I'm laughs> I read that Michael Crichton book and I'm scared, but anyway, so, the, um, but Emory has a lab that's kind of a, you know, not a, not a super toxic lab or anything like that. But they need, labs need lots of ventilation air, right? So lots of outside air. They had uh, originally designed this building to handle all the outside air with simple mechanical dehumidification. Basically, that diagram I showed a minute ago, that thing. But um, they decided kind of late in the game that they wanted to be the first lead building in the southeast. And they needed to bump their efficiency. And they looked at doing this, and they calculated that it would be a five-year simple payback. In other words, the equipment cost more, but the energy savings were there. When they actually operated it, they found that it was a three-and-a-half-year payback. So they, they've already paid for the, the many times over. One of the things they learned, though, was what, does anybody know what will mess up your desiccant? What can mess up your desiccant? This is crazy. Hairspray. <laughs> So if you ever get mad at Emory University, just go spray a lot of hairspray around their, their outside air intakes. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I don't know what the, the you can replace useful the life, life expectancy is on until the it gets desiccant. Until it gets ruined, it's, it, yeah. it keeps regenerating. It's fun. Do, I don't know that we have any figures on. Yeah, yeah. Well, but, but see, nothing is, de nothing is regenerating the desiccant. But as long as, uh, generally heat will regenerate a desiccant. Okay, so heat, you can, so, It's you know, constantly, it's yeah. constantly cycling. It's right. constantly cycling. Exactly. And, I, and I, would, I would assume until things, you know, you've got foreign objects that gunk it up, such as hairspray, right. gunk, that gunk it, it is, it's got a fairly long life. It, I don't think anything really kills it until something that's not water gets in there and gunks it up. That's a good way to describe it. Well, that's a good technical yeah. definition. Okay, so another technology that you may have heard is this thing called chilled beams. Have y'all run into this at all? This is less common here in the South. But the concept, uh, or sometimes even radiant cooling, the concept of this is um, that if you keep surfaces around people cool, you don't have to necessarily cool down the air. And to cool surfaces, if you run like lots of tubes in something, or you have a sort of a chilled a ch several chilled beams, if you will, chilled cool water loops in here. This is designed to have natural convection. Warm air rises, gets chilled out, kind of drifts over here, and falls down, and it cools. The, what you're saving in this case is fan energy. You're not having to move a lot of fan, a lot of air around, and fan energy can get pretty expensive. So that's the the opportunity. The challenge for us with a technology like this is if I run water in tubing in the south in a building, what, and it's cold, what, what do I have to really be careful about? Yeah, condensation. So it's very important that the controls will keep this above dew point. So it's cold, but it's not too cold. You've got to stay above dew point. Dew point is the temperature at which the air will start to condense, right? Um, so I was actually at a building this past weekend that is the only one I know of in Georgia that has radiant cooling in the slab. It was at, it's at Callaway Gardens. It's at Pine Mountain. And they built this building, and they put, I, I've toured it before, they put literally tubing in the slab and then run cold water in the tubing. And when you go into this building, you still see a couple ducts. Those are simply for ventilation. But, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting little case study. I'm not suggesting this is the way we ought to build buildings, but, you know, it was interesting. We asked him, we're like, well, have you ever had issues where, you know, you, you slicked up the, <laughs> you know, you, you kind of overdid it or whatever. You, you had condensation on the slab. And they said, well, twice. Once, we meant to do it. And we were trying to see how hard we could drive it and if we could make it happen. And the other time was an accident, uh, like something, a controls problem. And it let it go. And, and it, literally, it literally got moisture condensing on the slab. I just think it's kind of an interesting concept. 
Um, and again, the advantage of it is low, dis is low fan energy. You don't have to move a lot of air. But I'm not saying that's the solution for our climate. Here's what we do think is pretty cool. And um, this is, I know, I know Joe, is have you all done anything with variable refrigerant? Yeah, all our new schools. This is definitely becoming more, this is, this is kind of the wave of the future. It's um, kind of similar when I was talking to you about the water loop heat pump system. What this is, is a device that makes, uh, refrig that pumps refrigerant around, and it sends the refrigerant to a manifold, and the manifold will send the right amount of refrigerant to each zone that needs heating or cooling. So you're kind of given what you need, and it, it, um, it allows you, in essence, to borrow BTUs from this zone, put it in, and send them over to that zone. So moving heat around is a lot more efficient than necessarily um, you know, creating heat, if you will. Um, so VRV or VRF, variable refrigerant volume, variable refrigerant flow, it's kind of the wave of the future. What system um, have you all spec? Do you know what the manufacturer is? Um, the, uh, the City Multi. Yeah. That's what we have in our suite center. There's another company is Daikin, and uh, I think LG has a system. I think Sanyo does as well. Who? Sanyo. Sanyo. Yeah, a, a lot of these eight. Th this is a technology that is becoming new in the U.S., but it's been more popular around the world. A lot of these are kind of Asian manufacturers, but it's a really neat system. It's a pretty cool concept. I think you're going to see more of these. Um, and then, Brandon, you want to describe this? It's a little hard to see, but the evaporative mesh system. Yeah, you can that probably we use. see it on your, your handout a little bit better. Um, we work, this is actually a picture of our eco office, and uh, McKinney's uh, is a, uh, a mechanical contractor um, designer uh, in Atlanta, and they worked with us on this. But essentially, we've got this mesh that surrounds our, our outside units. And um, when, when, the, when it's hot outside, we actually take rainwater and mist it. Uh, so the idea is, uh, can we cool the air around the units? So uh, we use rainwater in particular because uh, it's, it's very, it doesn't have a whole lot of mineral, so we're, mineral content, so we're not worried about scaling on the equipment. Um, but uh, on a really, really, really hot day, say if it's 90, 95, we can actually boost the efficiency of the equipment by uh, what I hear, what I understand is about 20%. Uh, again, that drives, that goes down as the heat's less, as, as the, the temperature's less, but on a really hot day. And it's, uh, you know, we're using free water, we've got rainwater, and then the energy we've expended, very little. It's just the energy to, to pump that. Um, so it's actually a pretty smart system. We've got really about six uh, larger residential units. That's how we've done our building. It's about 10,000 square feet. So um, but McKinney's has some stuff on their rooftop, that, a lot of different ones that they're using, some large package units. They've got some pretty large equipment they're doing this with. So it's pretty cool. So, so um, this is an interesting concept, the idea that you would catch rain, because it rains a lot here in Georgia, except when it doesn't. And you catch that rain, and then you hang on to it and do something with it. And one of the things, you know, we flush toilets with our captured rain, but we also use it for very hot days to, to mist on the condensing units. Um, so I think that's a neat concept. Um, just really quick, some things on ventilation. So the, there's a different code that requires us to ventilate buildings. It's ASHRAE 62. And the, the comment here is we're trying to provide, you know, fresh, if you will, outside air that's, that's clean and, and dry. And what we really want to promote is something like that enthalpy wheel, that you've got one device that will handle the outside air, and you've got one device, maybe even your package unit, that handles your space cooling. So space cooling and outside air, the, the trick is can we decouple those and have two pieces of equipment that are optimized to do each well? And that's what our system at South yeah. Face does. Unfortunately, I think you know, equipment manufacturers yeah. make things that are supposed to work in all 50 states. But yeah. we've got a very specific climate down here, and we have issues that are very different from California or New England. Um, you know, uh, moisture, moisture is a key issue of what yeah, we're trying so to do. So anything we can do to decouple uh, dehumidification and, and air conditioning is a good thing. Some of the HVAC folks, have we done, has anybody here done um, CO2 sensors inside a building? Have you all done that before? And so this would be a, an example of a room that might benefit from, if there's a lot of people in this room, we're breathing in air and we're exhaling carbon dioxide, right? If there's a lot of people in this room, the levels of carbon dioxide over time start to creep up. We can sense that 
And as the parts per million of, of CO2 goes up, let's say, it, let's say they go up to around 1,000 parts per million, we can send a signal and say, OK, I need you to open the outside air damper and bring in more fresh air, more outside air, more ventilation air. As the levels start to drop, either because we're pumping more in or because half of us leave, then what can we do? We can close those dampers down. So think of CO2 sensors as kind of like an occupancy sensor, if you will, and it counts the people in the space, and it adjusts the ventilation accordingly. Big time energy savings in certain applications can be had with this. And as a result, the new energy code is actually requiring this in certain applications. Okay, so that's a big thing. I want to make sure that you guys are hearing that. Um, we are, we're big on mixing the, the ventilation into the breathing zone. This is a good room as an example that we're in right now. The breathing zone for me, guess where it is? I'll give you a hint. It's right here. Guess where yours is? Kind of down here. Okay. So somewhere between about here and here is the breathing zone for most people. Unless you're laying on the floor, I guess it's down there. All right. Um, what it's really saying is, look, you know, I don't care if 30, 40 feet over my head, the air mixes really well. What I care about is the ventilation air is getting into my breathing zone and mixing it up really well. And some systems do a better job of that than others. Um, I think I have a picture of your underfloor system coming up somewhere, but yeah, you want to describe your office? Well, or? yeah, I mean, you know, there's a couple of different ways to do it. I mean, you can take the duct work and actually pull it down the wall. Uh, and, and have your supply air, that's going to help. Or um, what we have in our office is actually what they call a UFAD, which is an underfloor air distribution system. So essentially we've got a raised floor. And you see some of these in, in uh, computer rooms or you know, maybe they have an open office where they want to run wires. But the, the other benefit of it is you use that whole thing like a plenum. Um, and it, it actually is much closer to your breathing zone. You don't have to use as much fan power, so it tends to be more efficient. First time cost, though, initial upfront cost can definitely be more expensive. But it does a very good job of mixing the air where you want it. I, I will, have you all done anything with underfloor? Anybody done? I will caution you <laughs> with underfloor. It turns out that those systems are not immune to problems either. Um, one of the big ones being, of all things, duct leakage. In other words, they, people inadvertently don't air seal that plenum space that's under your feet, and you end up accidentally sending some of your pressurized air into other parts of the building or outside or things like that. And so be very cautious about air, you know, duct sealing is really important when the floor is your duct, I guess is what I'm getting at. But if it's done right, it, it, it's a very low pressure duct system in essence because it's so big. So you can move air around and let it kind of bleed into the space and introduce it in essence where the breathing zone is. So it can work really well in a high ceiling building. Um, okay. We want to have our buildings be under positive pressure. We want to pull in outside air from good sources. Where are some places that are not so good to pull outside air from? I like this picture. It's got the smoking area and the loading dock right next to the outside air intake. What are some other places that maybe are not so good? Can you think of any? The sewer stack, I think that's a bad place to put right next to your outside air intake. My wife had that happen on one of her projects. Uh, we just arbitrarily moved the plumbing stack right, right there. It was easy to find the problem, though. that was the good news. Uh, what's, what's another place? Um, what are, you know, the, the, the dumpster, the backup diesel generator, um, that's a common one. Um, the loading dock, stuff like that. We, we see that, that's, a, that's a, a occurrence that has happened on a number of buildings where people have not paid attention. So it's a challenge sometimes to get outside air from a good spot. But it's a very, very important. OK, you look very excited by this. So I'm going to show you a picture of a commercial building that is near our building in Atlanta. And I want you to sort of put some of this into perspective of air quality is about pollutants. What do you think that maybe wasn't so good about this building? By the way, in case you don't know, this is the return. It's an open return. There's the filter. There's the refrigerant coil and the ductwork. What do you see that's maybe not so good from an air quality standpoint? <laughs> <laughs> you got it. You got it. So maybe not so good after all. So, all right. Well, that's going to wrap up our um, our uh, HVAC 101. We get to talk about some of the things that we'd like to see more of and less of. Um, and and here's a quick kind of overview of 
the way the code is, is, is mainly dealing with HVAC. Um, there are standards for equipment efficiency based on the size and type of equipment. There's pages and pages of exciting charts of which I will not bore you with. But for the, the good news is a lot of times most manufacturers, much of what they sell is, is going to pass code, so that's good. Duct work is very important in the commercial code. It has to be sealed, it has to be um, insulated, and if, if it's a certain pressure, you have to actually pressure test it. Okay? Also, duct balancing is unbelievably important in the energy code. You must do duct balancing. The other big thing, they want the system to be shut off when no one's in the building, or the capability of it to automatically be shut off when no one's in the building. So you should take that away. Code officials in particular, they're looking for controls that when that building is not occupied, automatically the system will shut off. That's a, a, a very big energy savings. And then, Brandon, this is for our friends that need more. You got to have more. Yeah. Here you go. <laughs> there's that. Also, you skipped over. Um, there's another, you know, we talked about doing oh. load calculations. You don't have to size to that, but you have to do a fan motor power calculation. So um, they're trying to make sure that you're, the way you size your ducts and the way you size your fan, that you're not using too much energy uh, to essentially move your air. Yeah, without really saying it, what it's, it's basically saying is, if you've got to move 1,000 CFM, we don't want you to try to move it through a duct this big. Okay? That would require too much fan energy. So in, in essence, it's constraining you by saying your ducts need to be big enough that you're not using too much fan energy. So that's the only calculation. And, uh, and you know, generally, I think if you use good, good practice, you shouldn't have too much of a trip hazard. Oh, yes, the, the video is there if you want to learn the whole thing. Yeah, and, well, yeah. actually, in that, on that website, there's a lot of information. That's, <laughs> that's really is a good, uh, they've got envelopes, they've got lighting, so it's a good resource. Envelope lighting and mechanical, about an hour and a half broadcast on each of those. Um, but the HVAC is the, probably the big one. We are going to cover the simple systems approach. Yeah, and, and we like this. Again, if you look at, is, everybody, is anybody here familiar with CBEX, the Commercial Building Energy Consumption Survey? Uh, they do that, and they look at, they look at buildings uh, around the country, and they break them up. And if you look at it, uh, uh, the simple system is, is based upon buildings that are 25,000 square feet and under. If you look at the Atlantic region, um, which we fall into about 80 to 85 percent of all commercial buildings are, are that size or smaller. So that's a large swath of the commercial building population. So they said, hey, let's, let's have a simple approach uh, for mechanicals uh, for this very broad section of the commercial building population. Uh, essentially, you have to t uh, meet 15 requirements. Um, some of these are a little more restrictive uh, than the straight up prescriptive code. Um, but all you have to do is these 15 and you pass code. Um, it is, there, there are some limits. Again, first and foremost, that 25,000 square feet, it can only be a one or two story building. Uh, each system can only serve a single zone and then it's air cooled or evaporatively cooled systems only. Uh, but again, for the vast majority of the buildings you're, you're going to be working on, this, this will work. Okay, so we're going to look at these 15 items and you're going to find that about five of them have to do with putting in the right thermostat. A couple of them don't apply to your project, and at the end of the day, it's really, it's really just check I'm good on all these, you're done. That's all you have to do. So first of all, like Brandon said, each system has to serve its own zone. No multi-zone controls. You get into that, that's a complicated building. You got to go beyond the simple compliance path. Um, cooling is your standard package or split. Yes, question. Each mechanical box. Yes, you can have more than one system, you more but one each system. one serves its own zone. Yeah, and what they don't want is one system with a whole bunch of zone controllers, and, and, and you can do that, but that gets more complicated. So, yeah, sorry, thanks for the clarification. Um, cooling is split or packaged. Uh, Economizers might be required. If they are required, you have to use them. Heating can be packaged or split. Heat pump, gas, electric, hot water. Any of those, as long as they meet the minimum efficiency. So lots of options on heating, but steam is not part of that. They also don't want you to get too much of a process load. If you get too much of a process load, a lab, for example, is probably not a simple system building. So you, you're, you're, at, you're kicked out at that point. Too much outside air, and that's going to kick you out. The economizer, the way the code handles economizers is it says, look, you can trade off the need for an economizer by bumping the efficiency of the cooling equipment. You can bump up 
you know, a little bit and you can exempt an economizer. Or you can go and look and say, we're in climate zone 2A, 3A, and 4A. What does it say? No economizer required. So nowhere in ASHRAE 90.1 are we required to have an economizer in Georgia. So now we've taken our simplified approach down to 14 things. Yeah, so they, okay, that's a good way to look at it. We keep <laughs> yeah. crossing these out. So they get, they, you know, this is something that may change in future versions of the code. And, and it, it has does gone, change in this version. Yeah, it's gone back and forth. And actually, we've heard maybe in the 2010 that economizers are going to be back. So uh, we're sort of, you know, I think as, as Mike had described it earlier, we're in a weird place where sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. And, and ASHRAE has been waffling on it. Okay, so they want a thermostat that's like the one at your house where you have to manually switch it from heating to cooling, or they want it something that has a significant amount of dead band between. In other words, we don't want you to heat it up to 71 and cool it down to 72. That's too energy intensive, okay? And, and if you need that, that's a process um, heating or cooling or process control. That's beyond this simple system. They want the heat pump, if you got a heat pump, to, to provide lockout, so if the outside temperature is 50 degrees, that the electric strip heat does not kick on. We don't want to use the auxiliary heat when it's only 50 degrees outside. Um, they don't want any reheat, so reheat is out on the simple approach. Reheat is generally banned from the code, with a few exceptions, mainly for process kind of stuff. And anything bigger than about one and a quarter tons, it's not a very big system like a motel, they want to have a time clock control. So once again, a seven-day programmable thermostat will satisfy all these control things. Um, pipes have to be insulated. The insulation has to be protected from the weather. Duh. Okay, I, oh, sorry, you're not allowed to say duh in front of that. We could, but it kind of makes sense. Ducts have to be uh, sealed, and the plenum has to be insulated, so the ducts have to be insulated. Here's the big one. The big one is number 12. Yeah. Uh, the ducted systems have to be air balanced, so you've got to have a test and balance um, contractor come in and make sure the system's balanced. Uh, you know, this goes back to some of the things we were talking about in, in terms of pressures and things like that. If, you're, if, you're, if your system's not working the way it's supposed to, you may have some really odd things going on in terms of positive pressure, negative pressure, and that can have some serious impacts on your building. So balancing ducts is probably one of the biggest things. It's probably the hardest of all the 15 items is you must have duct systems balanced. Okay, Did everybody catch that? Code officials, there's, there's no option for this. You must balance duct work. You must have it balanced within 10% of the design airflow. That is a requirement. Other, another control device, thermostats have to be interlocked. So for example, in this room, we don't want a thermostat on this side of the room heating and then a thermostat on this side of the room cooling. Kind of make, slug it out, see what, who wins. Um, you don't have to do, you can't have that. And if you have a certain, anything over 300 CFM, you need to have a damper in the exhaust. And um, finally, if you have a bigger system, 10,000 CFM, you know, that's a, that's a larger uh, air handler system, then you have to have optimum start controls. Okay, but other, you know, most small systems are. So when you actually look at these, a lot of these don't apply. A lot of these are based on putting in a seven-day time clock or programmable thermostat. This is actually a really pretty simple approach. Notice none of the 15 items that we just mentioned said the word load calculation. Interestingly enough, a load calc is not actually required for yeah. this part of the code. So that's kind of bizarre. Does anybody have questions about simple systems? All right. If you are not a simple system, you go on to the next part of the code, which is you have to do all the mandatory things, and then you have to do, if they apply, and then you have to do any of the prescriptive things if those apply. I'm going to go through this very quickly, but here's an example of some of the things that are mandatory requ control uh, requirements. Your equipment has to be, meet the efficiency levels. You have to have lots of the control capability. You have to have um, uh, drawings that show com construction and insulation details. You have to actually provide as-built drawings, this is an interesting one, to the owner within 90 days of substantial completion, and you have to have balancing and commissioning. I always like to point those out. Those are interesting. I don't think those happen a lot, but they, they're supposed to. Um, equipment efficiency, lots and lots of charts that look like this. Very exciting. Load calculations are required to be done, but you do not have to size to them. Uh, zoning. They basically want commercial buildings to be zoned like this. 
by orientation, and then if big enough, an interior core zone. That's what we usually do. It's kind of common sense. Um, and they want zone controls to basically have at least a five degree dead band. Here's an example where they're going to allow you to lump these zones together. They're all kind of acting as one zone, but by orientation, the other zones and the core. Um, again, dead, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You guys look so excited right now. Uh, look at all these great things that are popping up. So basic control requirements that the code is asking us to do, capability of optimum start, or zone isolation, like it's a 20-story building and someone wants to come in and work over the weekend on the 12th floor. We need to make sure the 12th floor alone gets heated or cooled, not the entire building. Um, and there's some, always some exceptions. And, and there's always exceptions in the code. Uh, mandatory provisions for controls they want, uh, you know, the seven day week uh, time clock capability, um, and they want manual override for weekends. You can push a button to get the manual override, for example. These are bigger systems. Off hour controls, um, optimum start, I'm going to go fast through these. Um, methods of doing zone isolation. Um, Motorized dampers, uh, these are except for us because um, we're in zone three, so we can exempt us. And again, that provides a shutoff dampers, exe again, except, except for zone three, so that exempts us. Um, they have this interesting one. There's no way a code official could ever enforce this, but they're saying dampers cannot be leakier than this amount. <laughs> How do you enforce that as a code official? That's an unenforceable provision. And um, Heat pumps, you need to make sure that heat pumps have that lockout so the electric auxiliary heat won't kick on if the heat pump can meet it. And humidifiers, which we don't see many of those. Here's the big one. Uh, demand control ventilation, that's the CO2 sensors, are required. They are required uh, in, a, in a system with high occupancy, in, a, in a, a, an area with high occupancy, more than 40 people per thousand square feet. If you have an airside economizer, or automatic control of the outside air dampers, or greater than 3,000 CFM. So this is a, this is a, what they're saying is in applications where lots of variable occupancy or high density occupancy occurs, demand control ventilation is a really good idea. Um, and of course, there's always exceptions. Uh, ducts have to be insulated. The insulation has to be protected. Same for pipes. Here's some charts. The bottom line, when you read these exciting charts, for most of us, the answer is R6. The decks need to be insulated to, be, to R6 if they're in unconditioned space. Um, pipe insulation, certain thickness of pipe insulation. Uh, leakage testing. If the duct system is more than three inches of water column, you'll have to test a one in four duct systems. You have to provide completion drawings uh, within 90 days of the system acceptance. And then system balancing is very important also in th this pathway. Commissioning, you have to commission buildings that are over 50,000 50, square feet. 50,000 square feet, yeah. So everybody catch that? Bigger buildings must be commissioned, whether LEED requires better commissioning than baseline ASHRAE, but ASHRAE yeah. requires a certain level of commissioning that must be done in any building over 50,000 square feet. So that takes us out of the mandatory section. You all look very excited by that. I'd just like to tell you, your excitement factor. I'll tell you what, if you just sit with me for another couple of minutes, you can go have extra pudding. Okay, that's your reward. So. Those who are late do not get fruit cup. All right, so the prescriptive section is basically saying, look, if you have to have an economizer, here's all the rules for economizer. Or in general, you can't use simultaneous heating and cooling, but here's some exceptions of where you can. So just appreciate that these are, if you've got them, follow the rules for each of these. And I put a couple of these in as an example. So for example, si simultaneously heating and cooling, no reheat. That's not allowed, except all these applications where it is allowed. Zones with special pressurization requirements, like a hospital. Zones with code required minimum circulation, like a lab. Zones where you're getting a lot of free reheat from, say, solar. Um, or s recovered heat. Those, that's free reheat, you can use it. So that's an example where you can. Um, we talked about the calculation that the engineers have to do to make sure the ducts are at least big enough. The ducts are at least, this is basically it. And you can do it based on nameplate horsepower or, or um, brake horsepower. 
it, you get into bigger and bigger systems with more outside air, they want you to have energy recovery. Okay, so a system that has more than 5,000 CFM of outside air, <coughs> uh, or basically a high amount of outside air, 70% of your supply air is, is outside air, um, they want you to have at least a 50% energy recovery. So once again, a bajillion exceptions, crazy toxic labs and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So um, water side energy recovery, similar thing. Oh, no, no, actually this is a big one. If you have a big system, and by that I mean an, a hospital, that, why don't they just come out and say hospital? A big facility that operates 24-7 and is rejecting 6 million BTUs an hour and has a water heating load of a million BTUs per hour, you must capture this waste heat and use it to preheat your hot water. Kind of makes sense. Does that, does that make sense? You've got, you got a building that's probably air conditioning year round. You're rejecting tons of heat all the time. And you need a lot of hot water need. That's a, that's a hospital. That's a perfect application to do. Capture the waste heat and then, and then use it um, to, uh, to preheat your hot water. By the way, solar actually is really attractive for um, things like that. We know some hospitals that have retrofitted solar because they have such a consistent hot water need in those hospitals, it was a great, opportun great opportunity. Okay, um, and then finally, uh, certain things about range hoods. Certain si size range hoods have to have makeup air. What a great idea. Okay, so congratulations. You've suffered through the mechanical section. Yay!